Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in tonight. If I seem a little off, it's because Chris made me eat a Big Mac, and I'm pretty sure it's killing me from the inside out. Um, all right, let's get started. So we're going to take questions from the home audience. I have also have quite a few questions that people have sent in for the week. Um, I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to start with something that people have been asking me for weeks, and I've meant to sort of give my opinion on it, and I have just done some research on it this week. So a lot of people ask about what's the best way to breathe, and one way of breathing that people ask about quite often is something called the Buteyko breathing method. And I want to just talk about that a little bit and say, do I think it's good or do I not think it's good? Essentially, the Buteyko breathing method is something that there's a, a theory that most um, respiratory difficulties are caused by some type of, quote, hidden or undiagnosed hyperventilation um, syndrome and you know like anything else I'll always say that not all things are for all people so my advice would be to try to try it and if it works for you that's great but just some differences some key concepts from um, Buteyko breathing so the first one is nasal breathing so the Buteyko method does emphasize the importance of nasal breathing and they believe it protects the airways by humidifying warming and cleaning the air entering the lungs and we know that we know that when you breathe in through your nose, three functions are accomplished. It filters the air, it warms the air, it humidifies the air. All three of those functions help the body use it better. Okay? Um, according to the Buteyko method, a majority of asthmatics have problems sleeping at night, and they believe by and Buteyko practitioners believe that this is linked to poor posture or unconscious mouth breathing. Most people do mouth breathing at night. Um, the other thing is that um, Buteyko practitioners believe that if you strictly encourage nasal breathing during the day, your nighttime symptoms can actually improve and that you can actually, um, you know, you can actually, that can become your natural breathing pattern, which I don't necessarily agree with. Um, there's not a lot of support in the medical community for Buteyko breathing, and I'm, I don't necessarily think that's because it, it doesn't work, um, even though I'm not saying it works, but I think it's because there's not a lot of hard clinical uh, research that supports it. Um, now, you know that most things that we do when we're exercising, we're doing in through your nose and out through your mouth. And the reason why I don't think it, that breathing out through your mouth is necessarily the best breathing method for people with respiratory disease is because one of the problems with exhalation, and it doesn't matter if you have restrictive diseases like interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, um, you know, or obstructive diseases like emphysema and chronic bronchitis, I think that there's a lot of airway collapse on exhalation. And by blowing out through your mouth through pursed lips, the biggest benefit of all is that you create a back pressure that actually helps to keep the airways open and actually helps to keep the alveoli, um, which are the air sacs where gas exchange occurs, um, open as well and prevent collapse. So Buteyko breathing, I would never say do something or don't do something. Uh, you know, I think that all things are worth trying. I don't think that Buteyko breathing is something that our practice is going to employ on a regular basis. I think there's too much benefit from blowing out through your mouth through pursed lips. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of other questions that I've received for the week, and then we're going to go through. Um, we'll go through some questions from home. We'll let some people get online, and, and we'll hear their voices. So. One question I got is, what if you are afraid to take the PFT because you can't breathe? So what if you're afraid to take the PFT? The PFT is the pulmonary function test. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, two parts to this question, which are, you know, are, are unclear from the question itself. But if you're afraid of the actual procedure, okay, usually when somebody gets a pulmonary function test, um, they are done under very controlled circumstances and, um, you know, a set, why is that so big? Okay, so essentially uh, it's done under controlled circumstances in a medical situation where if you actually got into a jam, there are bronchodilators right there um, and you can actually, um, you, can, you can be helped, but there's also going to be medical staff there as well. Now, a lot of times I hear people say things like, I don't want to take the test because I don't want to know how bad things are. And, you know, I know sometimes taking a test can be a scary thing. Finding out bad medical information can be a scary thing. Um, often I think the fear of finding out information is often worse than, than the actual information itself. But one thing I'll say is that, it's, in my opinion, it's always better to know. You know, even if you find out the worst possible case scenario, 
um, at least you have an opportunity to explore different options and really consider things, uh, you know, both with your family, with your medical team, with your friends, and really help to make the decisions for you. So, again, you know, if, you, if you're afraid to take the test because of the actual procedure of the test, you know, the pulmonary function test is not the most comfortable thing, particularly for people who have a hard time breathing, but we do get valuable information from it. And so I would say just, you know, try to, try to take the test. Um, let the technician or the physician who's, who's performing the test know that you have some anxiety related to it and ask them to please make sure that they go over the, the, the procedure with you um, slowly and carefully. Next question regarding the bike. I have found that people with pulmonary disease actually do worse on the bike and the treadmill. Again, two different things here. So one is potentially the act itself. So in other words, the, um, you know, why do people have a harder time on the bike? Most people walk, not as many people bike. So when we talk about exercise week after week, one thing that I try to mention and I try to make clear is that most activities are very sport or activity specific. So in other words, becoming a great baseball player doesn't make you a good football player. Walking well on the treadmill doesn't necessarily make you a great biker. And so whereas the majority of people get around by walking, less people, less people are going to actually get around by using the bike. So it's partly a muscle memory thing, partly a conditioning thing, partly a comfort thing. The other aspect of, of the bike is that um, from a mechanical point of view, as opposed to the treadmill, the, the thighs are actually coming up further towards the chest. And what that does is it actually increases the intra-abdominal and intra-thoracic pressures. In other words, the, th the pressures in the abdominal cavity, which are just below the, the thoracic cavity, and also increases the pressures in the thoracic cavity, and the effect of that is it increases the resistance on the diaphragm. So in other words, the diaphragm has a harder time contracting downward and therefore you have a harder time taking a deep breath. Chris, do we have some questions ready? So we have a question from Rita. Rita, are you ready? Rita, are you with us? Rita? Rita, we can hear you. Can you speak louder, please? Chris, you want to read the question? All right. Uh, Rita's question is, uh, what exercises can she do at home without any equipment? Okay, so great question. So what exercises can you do at home without any equipment? So not everybody has access to treadmills, to bikes, to upper body ergometers, to things like that at home. But you still want to get exercise, okay? If you don't have any equipment, in my opinion, the single best exercise and the most important exercise is going to be um, walking, okay? So again, it, everybody's different. Everybody starts in a different spot. But the goal when it comes to respiratory disease, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, is always going to be increasing your aerobic capacity. And so, you know, anything where you're doing endurance walking, you know, initially we want to build up your endurance, increase your ability to, to do an activity for a longer period of time, and over time we'd want to increase the intensity of that activity. And so what I mean is walking more quickly, walking uphill, things like that. You can also do basic calisthenics. So any activity where you're moving your legs, moving your arms in a rhythmic way that you can do in a sustained fashion, um, you know, those are all things that are going to help. Breathing exercises as well, you want to coordinate your breathing with any activity that you do. So, you know, you want to do a combination of aerobic exercise, which are sustained rhythmic exercises, which don't necessarily focus on resistance, and then also you want to, you know, add into it some strength exercises or resistance exercises, and you can also add some flexibility exercises to it. Over the next couple of weeks, I'll be making some information available about specific exercises that you could do, as well as a program that we do here called Armor Size, which is a 15 exercise upper body program where essentially you're doing 15 movements. As an example, things like crisscross, um, things like pump the tire, um, things that um, are essentially just movement activity. So any movement can actually be an exercise, and the way that you actually make an exercise more intense is going from more slowly to more quickly. So as you, as you make an activity quicker, it becomes a better exercise. As you do more of it, it becomes an ex a better exercise. As you add resistance to it, it becomes a more effective exercise. Um, as far as specifics, again, I will try to make a specific um, little program available that you could do at home. But walking is number one. 
and you know as much as you can anything that you do are using arms and legs so as you walk swing swing your arms kick your legs ultimately trying to increase your time increasing your speed increasing your intensity and, and incline do we have someone else Chris so let's let's have Ronan Ronan are you here Uh, Ronan, you're up. Okay, so I'm going to answer Ronan's question. Uh, Ronan was asking about the walker. We're getting a lot of feedback here. Uh, can you mute everybody? Okay, so essentially, there's not um, there's not one specific name. So let me show you one walker here. Let me just show you the the essential here. So so this walker right here is called the Winnie Light Supreme. Okay, the Winnie Light Supreme. However, these are different brand names or little names that are given to different vendors for the same walker. The key component is you want a three-wheel, a three-wheel rollator. Okay, so three-wheel rollator is R O L L A T O R. If you do a scan on that, there's very, you know, there's various models that you could use. But the beauty of the three-wheel rollator is it's nice and compact. It's light but you still get the benefits of getting the support of the actual rollator and you also get the benefit of having the fixed upper body and as we've talked about before it's that fixed upper body that allows you to get the respiratory support and helps that your respiratory muscles um, elevate the rib cage more easily. Um, do we have another another caller? And, and if it looks like we for some reason can't get people to actually get online then we're just going to ask their questions because uh, we don't do we obviously want to maximize our time. So is Diane is that Diane E here? Diane? Uh, Diane, can you hear us? Diane? Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and ask your question for you, Diane. Diane's question is, is there any advantage to holding an inhale of meds for longer than 10 seconds. Any better absorption? Okay, so Diane, you need to mute yourself each time. Thank you. Okay, so Diane's question is, is there any advantage to holding an inhale of medications longer than 10 seconds? So is there going to be a little better distribution? Maybe, but are there some downsides to breath holding? Absolutely, okay? So when we talk about holding it for five, what we're talking about is we want you to actually take a deep breath in, get the inhaler in, and hold two three, four, five, and what that's doing is that's actually giving the medication a chance to sort of circulate around your lungs, be absorbed into uh, you know, the, the, the airways where they can actually be used. But there's definitely downsides to breath holding on a longer period of time. So when you breath hold, um, that creates something that's called the Valsalva maneuver. Essentially what you're doing is you're not allowing pressure to dissipate. And so that has the potential to raise your blood pressure, that has the potential to increase your intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure. And for people with respiratory disease, um, very often the lungs are actually more delicate. And so we don't want you in a situation where you're doing a huge breath hold maneuver and putting you at risk for either um, you know, a small uh, blood vessel rupture or actually a rupture in the airways or the lung itself known as a pneumothorax. So, you know, we want you to hold your breath to give a little extra time uh, for, the, for the medication to circulate, but, you know, we're not looking for a 30-second breath hold here. So, five seconds, nice, easy breathing, and then release the air. And we'll try two more. We'll try to get people's voices, because I do like to hear people's voices on these. Um, is, can, uh, is candy available? Hey, Candy, how you doing? Okay, so what's your question tonight, Candy? Okay, so um, essentially what we talk about is when we talk about DLCO, um, we're talking about diffusion capacity. Okay, so we talk a lot of times about airway movement and pulmonary function versus the chemistry, right? So a lot of times people say, well, how is this possible that I'm so short of breath, but I check my oxygen and um, my oxygen's 98%, right? 
So that's, that's where I think a lot of the confusion comes in. So when we talk about the fusion capacity, we're not talking now about how much air is moving out in and out of the lungs, although how much air moves in and out of the lungs is actually a factor. What we're talking about here is how much air, once it's in the alveoli, which are the air sacs, actually is making it into the bloodstream, okay? And so, essentially, um, you know, you can get air into your lungs, but if you have a lot of alveolar destruction, as in the case of, let's say, severe emphysema or something like that, even though the air is coming in, you may not be getting the benefit from it, which is why people who have low DLCO or low diffusion capacity are actually going to be the ones who have a much lower oxygen concentration in their blood and a much lower oxygen saturation. So in that respect, um, you know, this, this is going to actually be done during your pulmonary function test, but it really has to do with how much air is actually making it into your bloodstream. Do we, do we have another question? Vicky? Is Vicky available? Uh, it seems like Vicky has another background noise over there, so I'll go ahead and ask the question for her. Okay. Uh, Vicky's question is, what happens if you have problems walking on three liters of oxygen, even if on a, at a short distance? Okay, so Vicky, are you with us? Because I, I, I'd like to... Um, I'd like to clarify that question a little bit. Can we hear, Vicky? are you with me? Okay, so when you say what happens if you have trouble walking on three liters, what do you mean by that? What, what's the trouble? Okay, so when you say that you're on three liters of oxygen, are you having difficulty because of shortness of breath or because your oxygen is going down? Okay, gotcha. Okay, let's mute. So, okay, so here's the thing. I want to clarify again something that I talk about over and over again. So, we talk about oxygen saturation as one factor. If you have poor mechanics of breathing, in other words, if you have severe COPD, if you have severe pulmonary fibrosis, if you have severe pulmonary hypertension, even giving you oxygen may not be enough to overcome the poor mechanics of breathing and the, the decrease in lung function. The way that you increase your time and distance of walking is to just simply, and I say simply, it's not simple, but to try to increase and do a little bit more every day. So as an example, let's say, Today, on three liters, you can walk 50 feet. And, you know, when we talk about what's okay versus what not okay, we're looking at three factors. So a lot of people are going to look at oxygen saturation. A lot of people have their own oximeters at home, and they're using that as a guide. So if you said to me, um, as an example, I run into trouble because, no, I run into trouble because my oxygen goes down, then I would say, well, let's try four liters, let's try five liters, let's try six liters, and that's what we do here. So if everything is okay except the person's saturation is low, we will give them as much supplemental oxygen as we need, up to 100% O2, in order to get them to do that workout. Why? We don't want them to desaturate because, as I've told you before, when a person desaturates, a whole cascade of other physiologic functions occur. It increases the workload on the heart, increases your chance of coronary insufficiency, meaning that your heart muscle is not getting enough blood flow and therefore not enough oxygen, um, increases your chance of cardiac arrhythmia. And so we do not want you desaturating. So if the problem is desaturation, then the answer for us is we will give you as much oxygen as you need to get that workout in because it's that workout that's actually going to improve the strength of your heart, improve the strength and efficiency of your muscles, and also improve um, the mechanics of your lung. If it's a shortness of breath issue, okay, what I would suggest if today you could walk 50 feet, and again, extrapolate that number to whatever you could do, the next day I would try for 75 feet. If the amount that you can walk is limited, okay, then I would break it up into multiple reps. So in other words, if I can only walk 25 feet, then I might walk that 25 feet, sit down, let my heart rate come down, let my oxygen go up, and then repeat. So if maybe the first day I'm going to repeat that five times, so I've done a total of 125 feet. Maybe the second day I'm going to do 50 feet five times. 
Maybe at a certain point I'll be doing 250 feet and I'll do it two times, little by little. Add a minute, add 10 feet, add 20 feet. But the way to do this is to keep pushing yourself and add a little bit more every day. All right, do we have another question? Let's go to Vladi. Is Vladi there? Vladi, I don't think I've ever heard your voice, so I hope your microphone is working. Are you here with us? Vladi, are you with us? Okay, so we're not hearing Vladi, but Vladi's question is, am I familiar with the NIOV system? Okay, and the answer is, yes, I am familiar with the NIOV system, and the NIOV system is actually um, something that we're prototyping here in our office. Um, essentially what this is, is this is a small device that, and I'm sure Vladi, you're familiar with it if you're asking about it and you want me to talk about it with people, so what it is, is, and, and the company that we're using right now um, has been generous enough to um, allow us to keep a couple of units in our practice and try them out with different patients. What the device does is essentially, in, it hooks up to your oxygen mas machine, and instead of simply giving you blow-by oxygen, meaning that the oxygen is being pushed out of a cannula or a mask, and it's up to your own respiratory effort to take it in, what the NIOV machine does is it's actually giving you a positive pressure and it works on as a matter of fact I might give me one second as a matter of fact I happen to have uh, the cannula right here and so if you can see this, essentially what's going on here is this is actually a much thicker cannula and it closes off the nostrils. So as opposed to having a thin cannula that actually just blows air by and then counts on you to do your own um, mechanics to bring that oxygen in, what this does is it closes things off and it's actually giving you a positive pressure that actually assists with the person's own ventilation. And so. In theory, we should be able to get a little increase in tidal volume. Um, we should be able to get a little increase in the amount of air that's actually being, being moved in. I would say at this point, we've used it on about seven patients. Um, some patients have hated it and found no benefit to it. Some patients have, have got, you know, see some benefit to it and have to give it a little more chance to see if they really like it. Some patients love it. So, we're going to keep it here in our practice. We're going to use it as a training tool on some people. We think there's going to be some benefit for both obstructive and restrictive patients, but it's fairly new. Um, certainly, this is something that I want to report more about as we see more patients with it, and hopefully at some point, if it goes really well, we'll be able to you know, start off as a, a training center here where we can actually have people come in and try out the unit. As far as um, coverage, at, at this point, Medicare is not covering it. At this point, there are a couple of private insurance companies, as I understand, that have covered it, covered it in the past. Um, and the machine costs somewhere between five and six thousand dollars at this point to the to the patient. Next question, Chris. Who do we have? Uh, we have Linda. Okay, Linda, are you with us? Uh, you know what, before we go to the next question, can you speak a little bit louder for the audience? Please? Can I speak louder? Yes, I can. Linda, are you with us? Okay, Linda, what's your question? Right. Okay. Okay. It's something that we've heard of, um, absolutely, and when I say we, I mean me, myself, and I. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it, we've heard of it. We use it here in our practice. We have um, a specific airway clearance unit here at the Pulmonary Wellness and Rehabilitation Center, shameless plug number one, um, and we do have the vest. There are a couple of different companies that put the vest out. I think the first one was actually called the Pneumo Vest. Um, we have one here. Uh, from a different company. Actually, we have three different ones here. So the essential idea behind it is that there are certain people, uh, you know, and it could be people with bronchiectasis, it could be people with cystic fibrosis, it could be um, people who um, 
you know, have chronic bronchitis, who just are producing copious amounts of secretions all the time. And, you know, whereas some people have access to chest physical therapists where they can do the treatment, most people are not getting treated every single day. And one of the keys is that if you're producing mucus constantly, you either need to find a way to clear it or it's going to severely clog your airways and your lungs and it's also going to make you more prone to infection. So secretion clearance is extremely, extremely important. Now I will point out that in a few months, I think it's in two months, we're going to be having a lecture, um, a webinar specifically on airway clearance techniques, but let me tell you about the vest. So the vest is essentially a thoracic vest that goes on, it, it looks a little bit like a life preserver, and it's operated by um, you know, air, and what it essentially does is it vibrates you, and it vibrates the chest moving up and down you know, in different areas, and in a, in a way similar to that you would actually have chest physical therapy where somebody's actually manually percussing you, the vest is actually doing this um, over the different lobes of your lung. And so we have had tremendous results with this um, here at our center. And so the way that it generally works, one of the problems with medical equipment sometimes is that people are, are in a position where they're actually renting and or buying equipment with actually, without actually getting a chance to use it. Um, we like to stock as much equipment here so that we can have people try out different brands, different models of equipment to make sure that it actually works for them. But in, in your case, it sounds like you're producing a lot of secretions. It sounds like you're having a hard time bringing them up. And when you have a tracheostomy, it also makes it more difficult for you to actually increase your thoracic pressure and your abdominal pressure enough to generate a strong cough. So the vest might be something that is, um, you know, that would be an advantage to you. So if you want, why don't you um, shoot me an email and I will get the information to you about the specific vest that we use here. All right, Scott, are you with us? Scott, Jay, are you with us? Uh, Scott, uh, try speaking. I think your microphone should be on. Okay, so Scott, it says COPD and pets. And I've gotten several questions about this this week. About Is he there? Scott, are you with us? I'll read this question. Okay, Chris is going to read his question. I was recently diagnosed with stage 1 COPD. My wife and I have two cats, and we are wondering if we should start thinking about finding them a new home. Or will they not be an issue with lungs down the road? Okay, so gut-wrenching question here. Okay, uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm a super animal lover. Uh, you know, I have a dog, I have a cat. Um, I've always had dogs, I've always had cats. I've not always had cats, but I love, you know, I love all animals. So this is a gut-wrenching question to, to start having to think about. Do you have to think about finding a home for your cat? Here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to many respiratory diseases, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, um, other inflammatory diseases. Inflammation plays a huge role for certain people. I forgot, I should have mentioned asthma because asthma is one of the ones that, you know, inflammation and, and triggers are really uh, a huge thing. Here's the thing. It depends on, first of all, you only have stage one COPD, which, you know, is a good thing. But my question to you would be, how are you affected by the cats? So if you know that you're fine when you're away from the cats and then you come home and um, you know, all of a sudden you start to feel more airway irritation, more airway inflammation, um, you start wheezing, things like that, then it may be time to you know, start thinking about getting a home for your cats. I have a cat, I'm allergic to cats, but I'll say that some days it's worse than others. So let me see if I could, I hear that people are saying there's low volume. Is this making it better, Chris? A little bit. Okay, I don't know why I, don't know why I would be, um, Okay, so I'm going to try to speak louder. Is that any better there? Okay, so I would say if you're acutely aware that when you're around the cats, you are having a more difficult time breathing. Either that's more shortness of breath, more mucus production, uh, tighter airways, more wheezing, then I would say yes. I would say if there's not an appreciable difference, and again, some people are more sensitive to it than others, then I would say that I would wait until it actually becomes a problem. Okay, Dale, uh, are you with us? Hang on, let me, let me get it. Dale H. Dale? 
Hey Dale, how you doing? I'm good, so I'm glad you found, you got to sign on. So what's your question, Dale? Right, right. Okay. So, okay. So again, what I, I just want to point out again, something that I point out every week, which is that anything I say is my own opinion based on my own experience with my patients and not a substitute for medical advice um, and not a substitute for communication with your, your medical team and your physician. I mean, here's the thing. Everything that we do has risks and benefits to it. So a lot of times, you know, we know that shortness of breath causes an increase in anxiety, okay? We know that anxiety can increase your shortness of breath. So in a case of which comes first, the chicken or the egg, if you're anxious and that's causing your shortness of breath, then maybe taking an anti-anxiety pill is going to help, A, make you less anxious, and B, you know, decrease your shortness of breath. However, there are different, many, many different classes of drugs to treat anxiety. And so some of them are narcotics, okay? So if you're taking a, a narcotic, which actually serves as a central nervous system depressant, meaning that it dulls the central nervous system and actually decreases your, your drive for respiration, then I can certainly understand the need for concern. But I would, you know, I, I, again, I think that the risk benefit here is that if you can't calm down without it and therefore you're short of breath because of your anxiety and then your shortness of breath increases your anxiety, I would try to work with my physician to try to find a balance between what is the proper medication, in other words, what is the proper class of drug, and also what is the proper dosage and timing of the drug. Um, you know, and also something to consider is prevention of anxiety. So maybe to be on something, you know, on more of a maintenance dose as opposed to sort of a code red where now I'm in a jam and I need to pop something, which is, you know, sort of what we talked about with the inhalers, which is. I would rather somebody take out butyrol 15 minutes before they know they're going to go out and walk uphill rather than try it without it and then get to a code red status and then all of a sudden they're in a jam at the top of the hill trying to catch their breath and then they you know, are going to have a much less effective time um, taking their inhale. So again, I don't think there's a blanket answer of is it good or is it bad. I think you know, your physician has expressed his concerns. I think I would talk to them about is there a proper class of anxiety medications that might have less of a, a decrease, uh, re less of a depressant um, effect. And Linda, are you there? Okay, we're obviously having technical difficulties tonight and I'm not sure why, but I'm going to have Chris read these questions because I, I don't want to waste people's time listening to someone's lawn mower or something like that. So Chris, let's just, let's just roll through a bunch of questions. Go for it. Okay, then this question is, please describe a productive daily workout including cardio, muscle toning, development, balance, etc. for a COPD or who has completed pulmonary rehab and has continued with daily workouts. Please recommend length of time, degree of difficulty, etc. that will be beneficial to a patient. Okay, sounds like a simple question. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a very common question. So people want to know what workout should they be doing. And very often, um, you know, one of the issues that we have with rehab is that people graduate. Are you hearing me okay? Am I loud enough now? Better. Okay, so essentially what happens is we, most people who go through rehab have some kind of gains in terms of they reduce their shortness of breath, they increase their exercise tolerance, they feel better, they're able to do more. Um, and then the question becomes, you know, sort of, um, well, what do I do now? Because in the rehab, we have all the equipment, we have all the monitoring, we have physical therapists, exercise physiologists, respiratory therapists um, pushing me, and now all of a sudden I'm expected to do this in my basement. So what next? So let's talk about that for a little bit. So let me be honest with you. I never would recommend that somebody do at home what they do with us in rehab, okay? Why is that? The reason is because everything we do here is done under fully monitored conditions, meaning that as people exercise at pulmonary wellness, they're hooked up to an EKG. So we're able to watch your heart rate and rhythm 
the whole time you're exercising here. We're checking your blood pressure every five minutes. We're checking your oxygen every five minutes. We are here to help you. And so invariably, even if you're the healthiest patient with COPD or IPF or pulmonary hypertension, I know I'm still not going to recommend a program for you that is 100% of what you've done in the rehab. So in almost all circumstances, we're going to back you off at least 20% from the workout you've been doing here from a safety perspective. So that creates some problems because obviously if you're used to working out at level 10 out of 10 for three months at the rehab and now all of a sudden we're asking you to work out at level 7.5 at your crunch fitness or your local gym, then does that mean you're going to decondition? To some extent, you might, okay? And so there's ways that we try to supplement that by having you do a little more time but with less intensity. But a simple fact is that the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people, cannot accomplish at home or in a gym what they do in rehab, nor should they from a safety perspective, okay? There are certain things that I do with a patient, even, I mean, as an example, a lot of times people ask me to see them in their home. And I really don't want to do it. Not because, you know, my knowledge is different in their home or not because, you know, even if somebody has access to a full gym, it is not the exercise equipment that changes the workout. It is the monitoring equipment and the ability to be able to see you in distress, see you short of breath, and know that you're okay because I'm actually looking at an EKG showing me your actual heart rate and rhythm in real time, checking your blood pressure, checking your oxygen. And the other benefit is that I have my team here so that God forbid something were to go wrong, we can actually take care of you in a, in a fast and effective way. So what is the ideal workout, okay? The ideal workout is always gonna start with an aerobic base. So you, you know, I think you sent me an email also and you asked for percentages. In terms of priority, aerobics are always gonna be the priority for any cardiovascular or pulmonary patient. So I, in our program, what we do is we do 20 minutes of treadmill with people, we do 10 minutes of bike, and we do 10 minutes of upper body ergometer for a total of 40 minutes of aerobic exercise. Now. Once people can complete that, and once they have a sufficient degree of aerobic capacity and endurance built up, then we add in strength training. And that strength training can, can come with weights, either free weights or machines, it doesn't matter, but you want to essentially work on the big muscle groups, exercises that um, work multiple muscles at, at a time, things like bench press, shoulder press, um, lat pull downs, things of that nature. And then you can throw in flexibility exercises. But a lot of times people seem to be looking for sort of the bare minimum workout. And the bare minimum workout should really be 30 to 45 minutes of aerobic exercise. And that's the single highest priority. I think that, you know, for the majority of people with lung disease, if you also have muscle weakness as a result of inactivity, you will get strength gains just by doing aerobic exercise. You will get strength gains. Um, you know, you will get flexibility gains just by doing aerobic exercise. So that's always going to be my number one priority. If I can't get a workout in, or if I can only get a short, a short workout in myself, and I don't have COPD, but I'm going to choose the treadmill or the elliptical first every time, okay, as opposed to weight training. One thing to keep in mind is that people don't live or die by strength training. People can live or die by, by aerobic ability. And what I mean is I'm not talking about the actual machines itself. But aerobic exercise and, and building your aerobic capacity can actually keep you alive longer, whereas the loss of aerobic capacity can actually put you in a jam, okay? Strength training doesn't really have those same effects. Now, if you're weak, if your muscles are weak, if you have difficulty getting in and out of a chair because you, your hips and your quadriceps are weak, then by all means, strength training exercises are going to be a plus, but I wouldn't substitute um, those exercises instead of the aerobic exercises. So my priority is always going to be 30 to 40 minutes of aerobic exercise followed by up to 15 to 30 minutes of strength training. But again, if you're only going to do a 30 minute workout, do do 30 minutes of aerobics. That would be my, my um, that would be my recommendation. Um, what else, Chris? Let's go. Uh, you want me to read the question? Yep. Okay. So next, yeah, uh, next we have a question from Rita. Please talk about the two different types of breathing exchangers, pulse and even flow. I find that when I am using my portable or pulse, shows less saturation than my home exchanger, which is even flow. The pulse even gives me more time away from home, but I find that if I do not continue to breathe through my nose, I am out of air. Should the saturation be higher on the pulse than the home? Okay, I got the question. So, 
The question essentially is, and, and we're talking about um, exchangers, so we're, we're, we're really talking about concentrators, okay? And we're talking about oxygen, supplemental oxygen delivery. So let's talk about that a little bit. And this is kind of one of the greatest um, challenges of, of oxygen delivery. So when we talk about oxygen delivery systems, there's many different kinds. So mo what most people are familiar with is, is at home, they'll have a plug-in concentrator. So that's the machine that kind of looks like a heater, it gets plugged into the wall, and it, it brings oxygen out to you. That's going to be what's called continuous oxygen, meaning that the, the oxygen is continuously flowing. When it comes to portable oxygen, which are, are essentially concentrators that have recently become available that you know people want to carry around with them, everybody wants three things. Okay, Everybody wants it to be light, they want it to provide high flow and high concentrations of oxygen, and they want it for, to last for a long time. So, you know, there's, there's an, old, an old saying that says, when it comes to a job, everybody wants three things. They want it to be done well, they want it to be done fast, and they want it to be done cheap. And, you know, essentially you can choose any two of those, which means you could have it done well and you could have it done fast, but it's not going to be cheap. You can have it done fast and you can have it done cheap, but it's not going to be good. And, and, and you get the idea. Same thing with concentrators. So, essentially what a concentrator is doing is it's taking air and it's breaking air into its, its subparts and it's actually making oxygen available to you. There are many misconceptions related to oxygen supplementation and oxygen concentrators. Let me talk about a couple of them. So first of all, continuous oxygen is always going to be better for you than pulse. Why? Because it's always flowing out. So if oxygen is always flowing, think about it. It's going to be better for you than if oxygen is going, coming out, stopping, coming out, stopping, coming out, stopping, versus coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. It's, it's common sense in a way. Okay, what's the problem with that? The problem is that you only have a limited amount of oxygen or you only have a limited amount of time um, to actually use that oxygen. So the more continuous oxygen, even though you're getting a higher, a higher flow of oxygen, the problem is that if you're using a tank, that oxygen is going to run out as fast. Now, the other thing is that when we talk about the settings on the oxygen concentrators, they can be very deceiving. Okay, so in other words, if you have a concentrator that says one, two, three, four, five, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting one, two, three, four, five liters per minute of oxygen. And the way that I know this is because if I put you on level five on your concentrator, I don't care if you have the ultimate Lexus Cadillac Porsche concentrator on the market, you're never going to get the same saturations as if I give you five liters of oxygen from a tank of actual med medical grade oxygen. So don't be deceived into thinking that those numbers on your tank are actually the liter flow. They're not. They're settings on the, um, on the actual device itself, and they don't correspond to liter flow. One of the best uh, comparisons, there's, there's uh, let me see if I have this, hold on. Okay, so there's a, a magazine that comes out, okay, uh, called the Pulmonary Paper, and a few months ago, in actually almost a year ago, so May, June 2013, uh, and forgive me, Pulmonary Paper, if there's a newer one than this, but they put out a article, and it's on their front page, it says, which POC, portable oxygen concentrator, is right for you, and what this does is it essentially shows you all the concentrators that are on the market, and it shows you... Um, as an example, is it pulsed versus continuous? What is the maximum dose of oxygen you can get per breath? How much does it weigh? And it basically, um, you know, tells you, um, you know, piece by piece a comparison of what can you get from it. So again, you know, a level five on your oxygen concentrator doesn't necessarily correspond to five liters per minute. Now, one of the other things is that think about what it's trying to do. It's trying to separate molecules of air. And so if it's this big, it's not going to give you a lot of oxygen, okay? So a general rule, the bigger and heavier it is, the better it's going to be at making oxygen. Um, continuous is, in general, going to give you more oxygen than pulsed um, and keep you higher saturated than pulsed, but it's going to run out more quickly, okay? So um, it's a tricky thing. And, and in my experience, I, I hate to say this, but 
If you need a whole bunch of oxygen, then the overwhelming majority of these concentrators are simply not going to suit your needs. And so you say to yourself, well, if, if I'm at the highest setting on the concentrator and I'm still desaturating to 85%, but it's making it that much harder for me to get around because now I have to carry around this 10 pound concentrator, you know, you, you really have to weigh out the benefit versus the downside of this. So, you know, there, this is a complicated topic. One thing I will say is that if you do have pulsed oxygen, um, then it's, it's really important. Okay, these things work like scuba tanks. So in other words, if you breathe it in, the way that a pulse system works is it's triggered by your breath and it, it, it's triggered by your nose. So when you go, that triggers the oxygen to go in. Now, if I have a scuba tank and I'm breathing in and out, I'm going, <laughs> but I'm not taking a deep breath and that air doesn't get into my lungs, I can use my tank up very, very quickly. Similar principle to pulsed oxygen. And so the other thing is, if you recall back a few months, but I'll, re I'll refresh it anyway, remember that you have to take a deep enough breath to, to pass the trachea in order for that oxygen, or, so the trachea is the windpipe, so you have to take a deep enough breath so that the air actually gets into your lungs where it's usable. If you just take a breath, Okay, a lot of people think that that breath is now getting oxygen into their lungs, but it's crucial that when you take that breath, you're also taking that oxygen in. So that breath that you initiate, the, or that first initiation of the breath, actually causes the oxygen concentrator to trigger and to actually release the oxygen. But if you don't take that deep breath in and bring that oxygen into your body, then you're simply wasting the oxygen, okay? And going back to Vladdy's question before, that's where a device like an NILV is actually a little bit more beneficial because in, a di in, in addition to just giving you that puff of air and then relying on you, it's actually causing you a positive pressure that's actually pushing some of that air and giving you a little ventilatory assist. I'm not gonna endorse or not endorse um, you know, the NIOB system yet until we've had a chance to really see it on much more patients. In a couple of months, I'll be planning to give a full report and, you know, we will be making, um, making that available for people to sort of prototype here at the center if they're interested. Okay, Chris, what other questions do we have? Uh, we have Diane E. Um, you could just read that, I guess, right? What's that? She just wants your opinion about those two types, Simbacore and Nadia. Give me one second. Okay, so question, um, okay, so Dally Rest, is Dally Rest like Simbacort and Advair? So, the, you know, one of the things about Dally Rest, Dally Rest is essentially anti-inflammatory. Okay, Simbacort and Advair are very similar to each other. So Simbacort and Advair are both combination drugs. So Simbacort and Advair um, basically each contain a long-acting bronchodilator, and that long-acting bronchodilator is a beta-2 agonist and they each contain a steroid, which is anti-inflammatory. Da Dally Rest is not a bronchodilator, and Dally Rest works more as a, a, a long-term anti-inflammatory preventer drug. So although they, they all have anti-inflammatory properties, only Simbacort and Advair have bronchodilator properties. Okay, next question. Uh, then this question is, do you consider housework, yard work, walking to the store, etc., to be exercise? Okay, good question. So do I consider housework, yard work, walking to the store, etc., to be, to be exercise? The answer is yes and no. Okay, the answer is yes, they absolutely are exercise. Okay, so if you say carrying a, 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 you know, a bag of groceries five blocks, is that exercise? Yes. Um, if you're doing housework, things like sweeping, things like, you know, making the bed, some of these things are, you know, they're all exercise and they are all... Um, you know, they're all physical activities, but some are better than others at being aerobic. So in other words, some of them are, are activities that are, you know, I would of course consider them exercise because you're moving around. Making the bed, you know, is considered exercise, but is it aerobic? No. It's probably not rhythmic enough and it's probably not sustained enough for, it to really, for you to really get the aerobic benefit from it. So I do believe that, you know, you want to include your daily activities in your exercise. But sometimes people say, I say, are you doing any exercise now? And they say, well, I do a lot of housework. It's usually not enough to actually, um, it's usually not enough to actually create any true aerobic gains. 
Um, Dale is asking about my book. Um, so, you know, I'm working on the book. I'm not going to lie. I have a, a ton of projects I'm working on. The book is going slow. Okay, it's, it's, it's painstaking for me because I want to get it right. Um, my hope is that it will be available by, the, by September. Um, if not, then I'll, I'll put a second you know, note on it as a, as a Christmas book. It's something I really want to do, but it's very hard to get 22 years of work into um, you know, a couple of hundred pages. And so I don't want to put it out too, too early and, um, you know, and, 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 and not really hit the nail on the head as I'd like to, which is really one of the reasons why we started the webinars right away. Um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier for me to sit and talk for two hours than it is for me to sit down and write, you know, three pages, as crazy as that sounds. Um, so I promise you it's coming. Uh, I, I, you know, again, my goal is September 15th, but, um, you know, it, it's going slower than I would like. So if anybody wants to ghost write, send me an email. I have all the, all the chapters translated. Um, all right, any other questions right now? Otherwise, I have a lot of questions here. Okay, so let me, let me go to some questions that I received during the week. Is it okay to work through shortness of breath if saturation is in the mid-90s? So the answer to that is maybe, okay? Keep things in mind. If you have a respiratory disease, the odds are you are going to be short of breath. It's the hallmark symptom of respiratory disease, whether it's obstructive diseases, whether it's restrictive diseases. Um, shortness of breath is a part of it. We've talked many times about the fact that, um, you know, one of the problems is that shortness of breath typically starts out um, at high levels of activity and as a result people t tend to avoid the activities that cause them shortness of breath and then the muscles that they use to do those activities decondition and then people start to get short of breath at lower levels of activity and so on and so forth. So you want to work through um, shortness of breath to some extent. However, oxygen saturation is not the be-all and end-all of everything being okay. In other words, you could be perfectly saturated at 97% but still be having a problem. So when we monitor people here, we're really looking at four parameters. So we're looking at the EKG, which tells us two things. It tells us the heart rate, and it tells us the heart rhythm. We're also looking at oxygen saturation. We're also looking at blood pressure. Now, I don't expect you working out at home to be monitoring all those things on yourself, but I would say heart rate, <coughs> excuse me, heart rate and oxygen saturation are a good place to start, but absolutely, if as soon as you get short of breath, you stop the activity, there's no way that you're going to improve. So you have to exercise through some shortness of breath. Now, if you want to know, that, you know, it's hard to sometimes know an exact way of saying this, but if you think of it like this, if you think of your shortness of breath as being fairly mild, somewhat strong, or strong, that's the range that you want to be in. So you want your shortness of breath to either be fairly mild, somewhat strong, or strong if you're working out very vigorously. If it's very mild, then the workout's not vigorous enough. If it's very strong, then the workout's too much. So as long as your workload is somewhat hard to hard, and your shortness of breath is in the somewhat strong range as opposed to the very strong range, and your saturation is fine, I would say that in, in most cases, we would let people work through that with the caveat that their heart rate and rhythm are okay and their blood pressure are also okay. Other questions? Um, I use a pulse oximeter while I exercise. My doctor does not want my O2 to drop below 90% while I exercise. Generally, my oxygen bottoms out before my heart rate peaks. And since my saturation is too high during the six minute walk test, I do not qualify for oxygen except during sleep. How do we get the insurance to allow oxygen during exercise so I can get a better workout? So what I would say is that if you're telling me that you're, um, that your oxygen drops below 90% when you exercise, I would simply recreate the exercise that causes your, your oxygen to drop below 90% and then document it. And that should be enough to, um, you know, that would, um, that should be enough to, to, to get oxygen covered by Medicare. Can you have shortness of breath? Okay, this is Barbara D's question. Can you have shortness of breath and not have low oxygen level? Absolutely. So you can be short of breath and not have a low oxygen level. So in other words, your saturation can be 95% and you can still be very short of breath. How is this? It could be because of the mechanics of breathing. So remember, we talk about the mechanics of breathing all the time. We talk about pulmonary function. We talk about your body's ability to move air in and out. So in obstructive diseases, in restrictive diseases, you can either not, you know, have a hard time blowing air out, you can have a hard time blowing air in, 
But even though you have difficulties with the mechanics of breathing, you're still able to maintain adequate oxygen saturation. Okay? And that relates to the question we talked about before, which was diffusion capacity. So if your diffusion capacity is pretty good and you, your disease is not severe enough that you have destruction of the alveoli and your air movement is impaired but not so impaired that you're not able to saturate well, you can actually still have good saturation. Okay, other things. Let me just ask a, a couple of questions. Somebody asked if you're, um, they, they said, really? Mid to high 90s of oxygen saturation, are you ever concerned with shutting down your patient's respiratory drive? We talked about this before. We talked about the myth of not giving people oxygen because people are afraid it's going to shut their respiratory drive. This pertains to people who are carbon dioxide retainers. So we know that carbon dioxide is actually um, the, um, is, is the driving force. So when your carbon dioxide goes up, that's what generally stimulates people to breathe in the brain. That sends messages to the chemical receptors. When your oxygen goes down, that can do it as a secondary nature. Now, for people who retain carbon dioxide, they, there's, there's a belief that because their carbon dioxide is chronically high, they shift over to what's called a hypoxic drive, meaning that they now don't respond to high carbon dioxide, they now respond to low oxygen. And so um, people believe that by supplementing them with oxygen, we can actually trick their body into stop breathing. However, during sleep, possible. During exercise, impossible, okay? So we, again, give people as much oxygen here as necessary to maintain proper saturation so that they could get the biggest workout possible because we know that it's that workout that's going to actually improve their body. So I'm going to do two more questions um, and then we are going to call it a night. So I use a CPAP at night. Do I have to use in through the nose and out through the mouth? The answer is no. The CPAP machine will take care of everything for you. Um, how do I prepare for hiking in the mountains this summer with my family? I live in Massachusetts and want to hike the mountains in New Hampshire. Again, you get good at doing, your body gets good at doing what you ask it to do. Um, and so, you know, the way to do that is to start walking up hills, okay? Don't walk up a mountain at first, but go to places where you know there are slight hills. Build up little by little. Um, and uh, let's do one more question. Okay, so Marion N. asks, I have pulmonary fibrosis and scleroderma and have a terrible cough, especially when rising in the morning. Have you had success in controlling this constant irritating cough? So this is a, a great question and you know it's, a, it's not a great symptom to have, but let me talk about the cough of, of, of pulmonary fibrosis a little bit. So the cough of pulmonary fibrosis is a lot different than the cough of let's say the chronic bronchitic patient. Okay, so where the, the, the COPD patient is gonna be coughing because they have a lot of secretions, because there's increased airway inflammation. In my opinion, the reason why pulmonary fibrosis patients cough is, is a little bit different. And I don't hear people talk about this a lot, but over time what I've come to, to understand and, and kind of feel is that the cough comes because you need to take a deep breath. And when we talk about pulmonary fibrosis, that's a restrictive lung disease, meaning that we have actual scar tissue that's not letting you take a deep breath. When we talk about scleroderma, scleroderma also acts as a restrictive lung disease. So restrictive lung disease means that when you need to take that breath, the breath is not there. So essentially what happens, and this happens a lot with activity, is that people start at, you know, increasing their activity, supply and demand, you need to take a, a deeper breath. So in the same way, if I were stretching a muscle but that muscle was tight and we get some kind of spasmodic spring back, I think there's a similar phenomenon in the lungs. And so I think when you need to take that, that breath in, if it's not there for you and you have the tight lungs, that can actually increase the coughing. Particularly as it relates to the morning, okay, I think that what's happening is because you're sleeping, depending upon the position you're in, and also the fact that you're, you're not taking as deep a breath, I think you're waking up, and in the same way that you might have a stiff back, I think you're waking up with stiff lungs, and so you, when you wake up and actually start getting going, I think that that's triggering your cough. We've had success with pulmonary fibrosis, both in improving lung function and also decreasing cough, and I think the nature of which we do it, you know, the nature of the mechanism of it is that by exercise people, exercising people, you know, initially not as vigorously, but working them up to vigorous exercise, 
what we wind up doing is we actually decrease the airway inflammation and I think over time we're actually able to increase the volumes and um, you know able to get a little bit more air in there and you know decreasing the spasmodic cough so again I think that exercise you know and I talk about exercise every single every single week I'm biased of course I make my business exercising people with cardiovascular and pulmonary disease but in my personal opinion in my professional opinion exercise is the single best thing you could do for yourself for almost every you know every every one of these cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases all right, we're going to call it a night. I thank you for tuning in. Um, the next webinar, let me tell you about the, web, the next webinar. So the next webinar is going to be on May 21st at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's going to be on, we're going to call it nutrition and the impact of, uh, we're going to say eat better, breathe better, the impact on food and nutrition on pulmonary wellness. Don't expect to log on and find out how many calories are in one scoop of peanut butter, okay? Although I might talk about that because I love peanut butter for pulmonary patients. Um, that's like juice for Jesus, peanut butter for pulmonary patients. But, um, but, but this is going to be an important lecture for you. And the reason why this lecture is going to be important is because as opposed to me giving you a list of foods you should and shouldn't eat, I really want to teach you about how... Number one, the mechanics of digestion and eating and, and, and these different things affect the mechanics of breathing. So a lot of people have either more or less shortness of breath related to when they eat, what they eat, how they eat, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I want to talk about the real issues related to nutrition, digestion, um, and weight both being overweight and being underweight as they relate to pulmonary disease. So. You know I'm not a nutritionist, um, but we, you know, I'm going to say this over the years, and, and, and no disrespect to nutritionists, but we've tried for the past 15 years to find the right pulmonary nutritionist. Um, it's a hard thing to find people who really understand the ins and outs of, of nutrition as it relates to cardio, you know, not as it relates to cardiovascular disease. As it relates to cardiovascular disease, every nutritionist understands it, but as it relates to pulmonary disease, there's a lot more to it. And those are the things I want to talk about, you know, in, in two weeks on the 21st. So this is, you know, one of the, it's a very important lecture. And I'm going to, you know, there's been a lot of research put into this and, and it's, it's a lot of good information. So if you're available on the 21st at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I urge you to tune into this one. Um, it's going to be uh, worth your while, I promise. So I thank you for tuning in. If people have other questions, feel free to email me. As, as anyone who's emailed me know, I try to answer as many questions as I can during the week. Um, and if I can't answer them, then I will tell you that I can't answer them. Uh, good luck. Have a great week. See you in two weeks, I hope. And thank you for tuning in.